All right, guys, welcome back. This is our episode. It's going to be on nymphs today. So buckle nymphs up. Nymphs and Priapus. Yes. Okay. I was like, I hope you didn't really want me to say the the one that I struggled with before air. So I was no. like, I thought I I thought we had an agreement. Like no, you were putting no. me on the spot. No. So yeah, we're gonna go into nymphs. Um, Dustin's gonna take us to through the stories, and then at the end, we're gonna talk about the cults of the nymphs and um, a fun little thing that I discovered called nympho. Lepsy. Yes. Yes. It is as provocative as it sounds. He just recently discovered it, too, and he was so happy. Yes. it's. I mean, it's not quite as exciting as the name implies, which I guess is kind of ideal, because I don't know if that would be a good thing that it implied something like that, but it still was pretty cool, so. Indeed. Yeah. It, is, it is something else. That is, yeah. that is That's your sure. teaser for the day. Take it away, Dustin. All right, so, nymphs were female spirits of the natural world, a lot of times considered minor goddesses of the forests, rivers, springs, meadows, mountains, and seas. They were also the crafters of nature's wild beauty, from the growing trees, flowers, and shrubs, to the nurturing of wild animals and birds, and the formation of grottos, springs, brooks, and wetlands. Typically described as beautiful young women who had attributes specific to their home, for instance, if they were like a sea nymph, they'd have like seaweed in their hair and things of that nature. If they were, you know, forest nymphs, they'd have leaves and like a crown of leaves and stuff. You know, they were just cartoons. Virtually, yeah. yeah. Now, there's many different types of nymphs, which is, I didn't realize there were this many. Yeah, it's there's, absurd. There's a vast world. Yeah. But there are freshwater nymphs, which were the oceanids, the naiads, and the hydriids. Then there are the tree and forest nymphs, and those are the dryads. And they are nymphs of the trees, forests, and groves. Homadryids, which are nymphs whose life force are bound to that of a specific tree. Then there's the malaya, which are nymphs of mountain ash and honeybees. And then that takes us to meadow and marsh nymphs, and those include Epimilides, which are nymphs of pastures who nourish the herds of cattle, goats, sheep, and uh, which graze their lands. And also they were the nymphs of orchards. Then there was the Limonids, which were nymphs of flowers and watery meadows. Then there's the sky and star nymphs. There's the... Nephilea, who are the nymphs of rain clouds. The Orea, which are nymphs of cold breezes. They're typically the daughters of Oceanus or Boreas. Then there's the Hesperides, which are nymphs of the sunsets, daughters of Hesperus, which is the evening star. Then there's the Asterare, which are the nymphs of stars, and most were the daughters of Atlas. But wait. There's more. There is more. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done. There's sea nymphs, which are the, uh, one is the Halaya, which are nymphs of the seashore, spirits of the deep, the waves, fish, coastal caverns, sandy beaches, rocks, and pebbly shores. And then there's the Nereids, which are nymphs of the sea. And then finally, we come to nymphs of the underworld, and they are called the Lampids. Now, the Lampids are the torch-bearing nymphs of the underworld, and they form the train of the goddess Persephone. I guess there is one more type. There are the Maenids, which are the orgiastic nymphs in the train of Dionysus. Those are the ones. Those are the ones to That's watch what, out for. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we were... Because yeah. remember, they, they like to rip people apart in a frenzy. What a way to go. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I mean, you get the revelry first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it worth it, though? No. No. No, it's not. <laughs> Something so for those of you guys listening at home and you're getting a little confused on it, you know how how did the Greeks have someone that's a, a small spirit of the sea or the ocean when they've already got these gods? So the the best way, and this is this is something that's like just putting it in the simplest terms. I wouldn't say that this is how the Greeks saw it, but the best way that I could put it is the the gods of Olympus and all these other deities. These are the the gods that oversaw these elements. They are the ones that controlled them. The nymphs are more of the embodiment of that. So typically, they're, they're one set of something. So like Dustin said, it's a certain tree. When that tree dies, they die. Or like a, a spring. When that spring dries up, they die. Yep. And 
we have to keep in mind too with the way that the the Greeks were. I've said this about a thousand times, but the each police they they all had their own set of characteristics for their deities. Their um, the who they would worship, who they would pray to, and the nymphs with their their water. They were they were very important to them because a lot of the a lot of Greece doesn't have the rivers that a lot of uh, other civilizations do. So these spirits of fresh water springs were very important to them because the, the mountains fed into them. And in a society where it's all important and it's all embedded and interwoven into their entire DNA, it, it's easy for them to come up with all these fun little names for things. So Now, I did want to bring up one thing. It seems to me like a lot of these nymphs almost serve as like cannon fodder for a lot of stories. Yeah, a little bit. And most of them do not have most of them that have their own stories, it's not beneficial to them. Yeah. They're usually either spurned or running from a god trying to, you know, have their way with them, and then they get turned into something. Or, you know, yeah, it's they're, they they kind of share the human's fate, and stuff doesn't really work out for I'm them. I'm so impressed with you. I was going to bring that up, Destin. <laughs> I've, you've grown. You've grown so much. So that is something that is really cool about them. They both they they're similar to humans in a way that they're not immortal. So as we talked about, they can die from certain ways, but also they don't. They could die of old age too. So that's something that a lot of historians have found is the the coolest element to it is they do have this this bond that we see in the, the human stories. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the caves and the sanctuaries for the cults. Um, obviously I don't mean like a, a cult in the way that we look at it. Obviously for them, it was a, a cult where a, people of a group would go and worship. So they, the offerings to them almost seem more of someone that is in touch with each other. It was a better relationship and you can kind of see it in that element of they're treated the same way that humans are. So you can see that humans are like, you know what? This is the doorway that gets us to being close to the Olympians, but we don't want to be near them. Those guys yeah. are jerks. These guys can attest to that because, you know, one gets turned into a reed and all of a sudden Pan's playing them like a, a flute. Yeah. So we, well, can, we can relate to that. Well, uh, and, you know, there's so many different types of nymphs because in some stories they are immortal goddesses like Calypso. Right. Calypso is considered a nymph from um uh, the odyssey but yeah. not all of them have that trait nope you know there's some that you know uh who is it uh thos i believe thus is the mother of polyphemus and she is the sister of echidna the mother of all monsters but she's considered a nymph a sea nymph which is weird yeah i mean it's weird that there's so many different categories because for humans, it's just you're you're a human. I think the but best... nymphs kind of have a little bit of right. a little leeway. They can be one or the other. Yeah, it, it's more of a. I think the best way I saw it explained is they're more of a. It's not just that they're a smaller element. It's that they're an element that focuses on one thing, whereas the each god is like a a Swiss Army knife. These yeah. guys are just, they encompass yeah. numerous they, things. They encompass they, numerous they oversee things. Oversee a whole vast thing while also having what they oversee kind of be taken over by other deities too so they're just like yeah that they cover that too but i also like this guy better so he gets that too so yeah greeks they're interesting yep ancient greeks it's me kind of a mess yeah <laughs> so now we will get into some stories of some more famous nymphs or better known nymphs you know stories that you may have heard but if not enjoy buckle up First, we are going to start with Arethusa. Such a beautiful name. It is. Arethusa was a, she was actually a nymph of Artemis, so she was chaste. She did not believe in any sort of sexual activity whatsoever. She wanted to stay pure. Well, as you know, in most ancient Greek mythology, that doesn't, that doesn't hold too much water with the, uh, with the gods. Ah, I get it. <laughs> Now, like I said, she was a nymph of Artemis who lived in Arcadia. And one day, she just happens to stumble across a clear stream and decides to bathe in it. She's like, oh, it's a nice secluded spot. The water looks real clean. I'm going to have a little bath. Well, unbeknownst to her, this was the, actually a part of the river god, Alpheus. 
And Alpheus is just watching her bathe in his stream. And he's like, wow, I am in love. I got to have her. Because yeah. <laughs> that's how, you know, the ancient Greeks, that's how, that's how their gods equate love is, ooh, I love her. I got to have my way with her. Yeah. I saw her. She's mine. Yeah. You know, your average thought of like a psychopath is kind of yeah. <laughs> what they have. We're about to get banned in Greece. Thanks a lot, Dustin. <laughs> I, I said ancient Greece. Yeah. <laughs> so he's looking at her. He's like, oh, I got to have her. So he tries to have his way with her, but she sensed his presence and intentions and she fled. And he chases her for quite a while. This is a lengthy chase. She makes it all the way to the island of, of Ortigia. And there she prays to Artemis for help. But what does Artemis do? He's like, oh. My my loyal nymph, I'll help you out. I'll turn you into a stream. <laughs> That'll show him. Yeah. Well, Alpheus is not to be deterred, and he manages to flow through the sea and mingle with her waters on the island of Ortigia. Oh, my. Yes. Because you know how rivers can... Mingle? Travel underneath oh. bodies of salt water. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what he does. That's what I was saying, too. Not mingle. <laughs> and then he mingles with her water. Yeah. But, but, yeah, so... She does not escape. Ar Artemis did not help her in the slightest. No, yeah. Um, literally didn't help her. Yeah. She pretty is, much made her sitting duck. Yeah, she's trapped. She's also a stream. Yeah. So, there's that. <laughs> and now her waters are eternally mingled yeah. with, the, with the guy she was running away from. Also mingled with someone else, too, because, I mean... Mm -hmm. Wow. Stuck in an eternal three-way that she didn't ask for. Right. So, if you're ever running from someone, do not pray to Artemis, or Apollo, or Zeus, or, or Hermes. definitely not Hera. I mean, Hermes, you know what? Hermes seems like a swell guy. No. No. He'll come into play later. <laughs> oh. Never mind. <laughs> Just pray to Bellerophon. <laughs> Bellerophon is the only stand-up dude that you're going to meet, all right? Yep. <laughs> Pray to Bellerophon. Yep. He'll, be, he'll, he'll help you out. Yep. <laughs> so now, that takes us to Harmonia. Now, Harmonia's story is a little more... not It's not as uh, heartbreaking, if you will. It's got, it's got a bit of a happier vibe to it. It's got a more harmonious... Ooh. Yeah. Well played. Yeah. Now, Harmonia was a nymph of the Ac Acmonian wood near Thermiscira. Thermiscira. Uh, yeah, Thermiscara, which is the legendary town of the Amazons on the Black Sea coast of Anatolia. Now, this is important because she was loved by the god Ares and actually bore the first generation of Amazon women to him. And it's kind of debated whether or not she was a naiad nymph of a spring or fountain of the town, or if she was a Malai nymph of the ash tree which is what the first spear was carved out of, interestingly enough. So there's a little bit of debate about her origins. But yeah, nothing really awful happens to her. She just bears the first race of Amazonian women. So she's kind of the mother of uh, the Amazons, which is kind of a cool title to have. When I imagine debates between historians, I like to pretend that they're in a pub together, and they're all like really, really big chads fighting with each other like no he was an ashen tree you know that's probably not too far off from what happened good good <laughs> bunch of chads well who together. who was it that was like a super bro and like tried to fight? was it socrates no plato plato yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know one of them was like a super bro yeah he got swole in the brain so yep. <laughs> that's awesome yeah and now we get to someone i mentioned earlier and that is thusa now, Thusa was the sea nymph mother of the Cyclops Polyphemus. You guys might remember him from the Odyssey. He was the uh, man-eating Cyclops that Odysseus and his crew had to blind in order to escape. But, you know, they never would have been there if Odysseus didn't bump his yeah. gums, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah, Boudicius on yep. the prowl. As per usual. Yep. Now, her name actually derives from the Greek word swift. So many believe that she was actually a minor goddess of dangerously swift currents. 
because Thu means swift, apparently. And the reason that she became pregnant with Polyphemus is because Poseidon laid with her in her sea cave. And like I said, she was also the sister of Echidna, who was considered the mother of all the Greek monsters. Her, so, her and Typhon. So let me get this straight. They got, they just beat Typhus, and they, they fought it all off, and then Broside goes, you know what would be really great? If I hooked up with her sister. Cause, yeah. Because at this point, they don't know. They don't know that it's not going to be monsters. Everything that Echidna made was a monster. Yep. And very powerful. I I I want to say wasn't Scylla and Charybdis weren't weren't they sisters of Echidna as well? I I don't w- remember. Weren't they all like a little monster I'm sure. family? I'm sure. I'm just saying, bro, side and get it together. All right. I mean, him and Zeus runs in the family. I know. I get that, but there's so many other Th- there's, options. There's no. The, the, they want them all. They don't want options. They want them all. I mean, I guess that's true. Yeah, but they're 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 a couple of wild boys. It just seems like a terrible decision to make. Well, yeah, when, you were almost overthrown. <laughs> I mean, and you just go and you settle down and you hook up with her sister, not knowing the ramifications. Maybe he thought of it as like a slight, like yeah, you know what I'm gonna do? Yeah, <laughs> killed your son and hooked up with your sister. Broside. Yeah, that that's probably more of their line of thinking. Was well, you know, you know, pour some salt in the wound. <laughs> <laughs> Very salty. Yes, because of the sea. Get it? Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so that takes us to Kelowna. Is that how you say it? Kelowna. Now she was a nymph of Mount. Calabdera in Arcadia. Now, this is where Hermes comes into play. You're about to find out why you shouldn't shouldn't mess with him either. So, Kelowna refused the summons to attend the wedding of Zeus and Hera in favor of being in her home. So, she was the only being that did not attend Zeus and Hera's wedding. Because they literally invited... All the animal, everybody, everything that existed was invited. And, but really it means everybody is required. Yeah. Okay. It's not an invitation. It's a, it, yeah, it's a summons. It's yeah. like you have to show up. Come, come and show me how much you love me. Yes. Bring gifts. And pl- plenty of gifts. Now, obviously this didn't sit well with anybody that she was like, mm, no, I'd rather stay at home. So Hermes angrily goes to her and turns her into a lazy tortoise so her house would be on her back forever. Hmm. Yes. He's like, oh, you don't want to come to Zeus's wedding because you like your home? Well, how about your home just stays with you forever? You're a tortoise. <laughs> and that's how he left. Probably did. Probably. And still that tortoise was faster at uh, responding to Hermes than Apollo was mm-hmm. in their episode. That's true. Outshined by a a one-day-old. But we're getting a theme here. Most of these get turned into something. (laughs) Now, that brings us to our next one, and that is Bublis. Now, Bublis was a naid nymph of a spring near Korea, or she could have been a Humadrid nymph of an ancient elix which stood above the spring. It's kind of debated. Like we said, it's just two guys probably at the pub. Like, no, nah, she was this. No, nah, she was that. Etymologically speaking, sir, <laughs> you could clearly see that this was a spring. White. You feel better? I lost all of our UK listeners. Yeah. <laughs> Deservedly so. Yeah. <laughs> now, her story is a little different because she falls in love with her brother. And when he refuses her, she attempts to leap from a rock into the sea. Now, other versions of the story actually have her hanging herself instead of trying to leap from a rock. But in the story where she tries to leap from a rock, the other nymphs grab her and save her, but then she is turned into a tree, and the stream near that tree is called her tears. (laughs) What? Yeah, so she's, like, eternally crying because of her brother 
refused her love. Hmm. Where do they where do they come up with this, man? I don't know. I would say you can't make this stuff up, but you know, they literally, they did. And <laughs> someone wanted to turn into a tree after they got rejected by their brother, so they told that story. I know. How crazy is that? Yeah, I'm that tree. What that's, if, that's what me? If, what if someone today reacted like that? Yeah. Not not like, oh, I want to date my brother, but like, oh, I want to go out with this person. They said no. God, I just wish I was a tree. And that 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 stream there, that's my tears. <laughs> You're it's killing like me. Crying forever. You're literally killing me. <laughs> it's so goth. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little bit, yeah. All right. That brings us to Pittis. Now, Pittis was an Oread nymph. And she was loved by Pan. Actually, let me rephrase that. There's two versions. One In one version, she was loved by Pan and Boreas. And she was forced to choose between the two. And she chose Pan, which did not sit well with Boreas, who blew her off a cliff. I mean, (laughs) in his defense, the statue of Pan and that goat, I mean, can you, can you really accept that? Like, if you were like, like, all right, man, my, my, my competition Remember, Boreas is an old man with purple wings. It doesn't matter. (laughs) <laughs> like you go so, into it, you're like so finally. He's not really. He's like finally. I don't even. You mean there's no no real competition? I've got Pan. Bet. And then she's like, I choose Pan. And he goes, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> well, this blows, and then he blows her off. Yeah, I get obviously because he's the North Wind. Hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, that was completely by accident. <clears throat> well, Gaia took pity on her after she got blew off the cliff. And turned her into a pine tree. (laughs) And they say, when Boreas blows through the tree, you can still hear her weep today. Jesus. Yeah. (laughs) How messed up is that? Now, the other version is that Boreas isn't involved. Pan just sees her and is like, oh, she's hot. I want her. And like chases after her. And she's like, oh, my God. What is that? And runs what is away. That? Bang. <laughs> and in order to escape, she turns herself into a pine tree. And then from that moment on, the tree then becomes holy to Pan, who makes a wreath out of all the pine branches, and he wears it on his head. So, and I, I remember reading it, and apparently this happens right before he runs into a silix. Mm. So, so he literally chases one girl down and she turns herself into a pine tree to get away with, from him. And he's like, oh, I'll just take some branches and make a hat with her and this tree will be holy to me. No sooner after that, he stumbles upon another nymph and he does the exact same thing. He's like, oh, she's so hot. And then chases after her and she's like, oh my God, I gotta get away. And she gets turned into reeds and then he pulls those reeds and like uses them to tie up his... uh. His flute. Hmm. So like, so he's just he's just trouble, man. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I mean, low key though, that was a pretty pretty solid day for him. Like he shows up to the an the eventful next, day, yeah, I the, would say. Shows up to the next meetings of the guys are like, dang, look at you, you got you got some new uh, new attire there, flexing a little bit. And he's like, yeah, I chased a couple girls. I think I might do it again today. <laughs> they turned into trees. He's like every day. He's like gets a little memento from them. He's like these are uh, these are the ones that couldn't handle. Good He'd be old. so decked out. Yeah. At the end of it, just these all are... these girls turning into plants and trees to get away from him. Just... You know, Pan is the type of guy that's like they just couldn't handle Pan. So take mementos to remind myself of when how I, awesome I am when I finally find the woman that's right for me, <laughs> the one who can handle the Pan. That sounds like some pan logic, yeah. yeah. I can't argue. The man that. who uh, fornicates with goats. Yes. Well, he's he got he's he's part goat, partially. Yeah. Mm, you know. Can't understand why they don't want him. I know. What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Turn into trees and reeds, apparently. Yep. Now, next, we're going to talk about the uh, Heliades and. Phaethon. Now, Phaethon was the youthful son of Helios, who, as you know, was the one that had the chariot with the sun attached to it, and he would yeah. carry the sun across the sky. Now, he begged his father 
to let him drive the chariot of the sun, and eventually Helios reluctantly conceded and handed him the reins. Now, his inexperience driving the chariot with the sun behind it kind of led to being, you know, fatal for him. So, obviously, he's inexperienced. He loses control pretty quickly, and he ends up setting the earth ablaze. Yeah. Appalled by the destruction, Zeus smote the boy with a thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Hurling his flaming body into the waters of the river Eridamus. Now his seven sisters, the Heliades, gathered on the banks and in their mourning were transformed into amber-tiered poplar trees. So yet again. That just doesn't seem fair for them. No, they were mourning their brother and they're like, don't mourn him. It was like, Zeus was like, look, you know what? I'm sorry I killed your son. All right, here's what I'm going to do. So that you always have some type of memento. These, these daughters of yours. I mean, you're not doing anything with them, right? No? All right, let me... Let me I'll Turn do them into poplar trees. I'll we need you, more poplar trees around I'll here. I'll do you a solid. You can look on them and always remember your son that I killed. You're welcome. <laughs> Fixed. I'm Everybody's so, happy. I'm such a generous yeah, god. Yeah. <laughs> he goes home to Harry's like, I fix everything I touch. God, I'm, I'm so good at what yeah. I do. <laughs> Man. Zeus. He's, he's good. He's, he's one good. of a guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's one of a guy. <laughs> That's all I got on the nymphs. Oh, word. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, in that story, we talked about that a little bit in Zeus the Z-Bag, you know, because uh, Phaethon can, uh, tricked his dad into letting him drive him, and then they're just too, they can't be tamed, you know? They're a lot like Zeus, mm-hmm. metaphorically and realistically. But some nymphalepsy. Hmm? Hit us. Yeah. Hit us with it. Yeah, so it's a... Uh, it was a it was a fun rabbit hole I went down. It's uh, very complicated too. So, uh, buckle up. Yeah, buckle up. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna go too into detail because, like I said, this is one of those ones where I like I as I was reading more, I realized it was probably, pretty uh, lengthy. Yeah. So it would it was like 73 pages was the article I found. Yeah. It was like more I read. It was like you guys probably won't care as much as me. So you know, there's articles. Look it up if you if you guys do care. So it's something that I've never heard of and. I was pretty excited about. So what happens with the, the nymphs and the way that they worship them is, like I said, they, they kind of take these other aspects of other deities. So you see them as, um, they have a duality of like the, the charities where it's like love and harmony, or they have the, the duality of like the muses where they inspire. So in certain places, there are sacred caves where there are streams of water, which is obviously very important to Greece because they, uh, they don't have the same type of, fresh water supply that the other um, locations with um, that we might showcase later on. And so the water for them has a huge element. It's a, an element of healing. You have stories where people with leprosy get healed. It's a, um, drinking water in some uh, small uh, stories has uh, an ability to inspire people. So there's a cave in which certain followers of the nymphs would go to and they would become possessed um not quite as possessed as we would say with the the main it's where they would rip people's heads off and stuff like that but i mean not everyone can be as awesome as the main it's <laughs> right no one can go as hard yeah as the main. yeah we, i mean if everyone was mated no one would care about the main it so <laughs> that's but true there this place would become a holy place to speak so this guy or because typically it was a male for this uh, situation. He would become ins- uh, he would be able to foresee prophecies. He'd be uh, like a uh, a poor man's version of the Delphi. People would come to seek him out for healing. They'd come to seek him out for prophecies, to for wisdom, for advice, any anything that the the not aristocrat uh, aristocratic. I almost said aristocrats. I every time, every time Disney. It's a dope movie. It is a dope movie. The aristocratic people. They they could go to the higher up ones like the Delphi, but the people that wouldn't have that type of money, they would go to the the nymphalepsy. I think they call him a nymphalite. They would go to him, and it wasn't nymphalite? just like a oh, nymphalite. Yeah, we'll go with that. Sounds like a beer. But so they would go to him for these these advice. Um, they would give sacrifices. In some tales, they talk about these random eighteen to nineteen. You know, or fifteen to nineteen year old women that would just get naked and frolic in the pools with him and his friends and stuff, and mm. 
it gets wild, you know? Sounds like it. It, it, it gets wild. <laughs> um, but by the cave itself would become this sanctuary, a place where even if the if he's not there, they could go to and they could get the same type of wisdom, the same type of inspiration. Because by drinking the waters, because they're the embodiment of that spring, they're taking in the nymph. And like I said, they have a little bit closer of a relationship with these nymphs than they do with the Olympians, like Zeus, who's Mr. Fix-It. These are actual nymphs who, <laughs> like, you know, they, they understand the struggles of mankind, the struggle against mortality. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool thing. Like I said, there's a... If you go on to jstor.com and you have a Google account, it's 100 articles you can read for free. It's on there. It's called Nymphalepsy and the Seizing by Nymphs or something along those lines. So check it out, guys. Pretty awesome. That's all I've got. Dustin's got something, though. Well, yeah. We got to conclude this rustic deity oh, yeah. thing we've been on with Priapus. Priapus. Now, we've, we've talked about him a little bit before, but yeah, that's okay. Yeah, a little bit, but we're going to go just a little bit more in depth. But I figured no better way to end the uh, rustic deity, our little rustic deity saga we've been on yeah. than with Priapus. Now, he was the god of vegetable gardens. Sounds lame, I know. But he was also the protector of beehives, flocks, and vineyards. Also kind of lame. Yeah, I get it. I mean, I think that's kind of dope, but okay. Well, <laughs> well, the dope part about him is his depiction. Mm -hmm. He is depicted as a dwarfish man yeah. with a massive member, yeah. which symbolizes garden fertility, I guess, if you say so. <laughs> And he wears a peaked Phrygian cap, which depicts his origins as a uh, Mycenaean god. And he's got a basket weighed down with fruit. So just picture this. This dwarfish man, massive member, and he's got a little pointy weird hat and a basket full of fruit and vegetables. <laughs> yep. Just be bobbing along, doing what he does. Now, his coal was actually introduced to Greece from uh, uh, Lampsicus, which is in Asia Minor, which would be... Turkey. Yeah, like Western Turkey, I believe, is where that area would have been, like Western Turkey. Now, it was actually a pretty big tradition to have primitive statues of Priapus set up in vegetable gardens to promote fertility, but also they were... They doubled as scarecrows. They would ward off birds. Interesting. Because they're like, wait, I don't, I'm not looking for that. <laughs> I'm just looking to eat. Oh, well, I mean, it'll give them something to land on. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh, true. The ancient Greeks. Well, the reason he's kind of as famous as he is, is because there's a very well-known Pompeian, yeah. Pompeian wall fresco. That the god is shown, and in this fresco, he is weighing his phallus yeah, against the produce one, yeah. of the garden. Yep. So he's got, he's got a scale. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he's got his Johnson on one side and fruit and vegetables on the other. <laughs> but that, uh, where did they say that? I'm trying to think of what museum they said that was at. I can't remember. But yeah, it's it's like a big it's one of their big uh attractions there. Very interesting. But yeah, he is he will cap off our Yeah. yeah he rustic happened, deity saga. And if you want the full story, um it's in the Hera episode cuz don't forget, she got mad at it was either Hera or Aphrodite. She got mad at him. Uh and she made it so the woman or the baby that was pregnant in her womb wouldn't be born normal and also uh he uh he's always erect until he wants to use it yes and then it's uh then it's inept then it's flaccid yeah bogus bogus you know what i mean <laughs> that poor man didn't even do anything to her no know? he didn't yeah <laughs> he was just a, he was just a casualty yep that's how it goes man right. olympians i wonder do you think they even let him eat dinner with him once before they kicked him out? I mean, you'd have to at least once. Would you, though? I mean, Aphrodite's pretty vain, so... <laughs> a lot of them are kind of... 
you know. Yeah. So I imagine the first couple times it was probably like a novelty thing. Yeah. And then after that it was like, yeah, this is kind of getting old. That's how I envision it. Unless Zeus was like threatened. Like, nope. Mm. Get it out. That's a valid point. Yeah. Poe probably wouldn't have been too happy either. Nope. Hmm. I don't know. This is see. These are the debates that these, yeah. This, this is this this is the heart right yeah. here. This is the heart of Greek yeah. mythology. Is these kind of debates right here? These talks like and, and Bellerophon and Bellerophon, obviously. WWB. He's the heartbeat. Yes. <laughs> Never forget what would Bellerophon do. And that's it, guys. Have a good night. Yep. See you next time. <laughs> Sonar, like a submarine. That's the noise it makes. You gotta find a way to put that into like whatever new intro song <laughs> you do. Just doesn't.